Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Hello, and welcome to Yogananda Podcast, Autobiography of a Yogi, line by line. This is, we are pleased to say, the first episode where we're going to talk about the actual text of Guruji, the actual chapter one and the actual first seven paragraphs. And with me, I have Mike, Lauren and Chris. How are you guys doing? Oh, very well. Very good, thank you. Very good, very good. Ready to start our adventure. <laughs> How many episodes we'll do, we don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> First and Indeed. I, um, I actually set, you know, someone gave us feedback recently about, oh, you should set us some homework uh, before, you know, for, for, the, for the podcast. Uh, for the podcast we're about to watch so we can prepare and that's a really good idea isn't it so in the, the previous episode of the podcast I am um, in, in the details description I put what homework you should do and I told the listeners to uh, read the first seven paragraphs of chapter one uh, page one really uh, so it does uh, go into page two actually as well so people would have hopefully have done that and that will uh, give you some good uh, background as hopefully more engage. It'll be more engaging for you to um, join this chapter podcast or join this episode of the podcast. And it was also someone else then uh, messaged me and said, um, oh, you should. Uh, did you guys listen to Brother Jay and talk on living the li- living the living the autobiography living the life of the auto- or messages of the autobiography of a yogi and I put that link on there so as well hopefully you watched that um it was really good I watched it I re-watched it it was from last year's or two yeah last year's convocation yeah Chris beautiful thing about uh the digital uh aspect of what we're doing is that if you haven't done that and you do want to do it you can pause <laughs> and go and read yeah. and listen <laughs> and then we're going to be here so you know it's like time travel um and um, if you if you haven't done that my good fellow uh, podcast uh, community um you are not alone because i set mike lauren chris lots of homework and neither of them have done any of the homework that i set them <laughs> it's like being back at school <laughs> It um, is. And, uh, <laughs> and they're all going to be reprimanded. No, just kidding. Um, um, Priyank is a real, it's an unreasonable teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you could tell that I was going to be before you started this <laughs> <laughs> series two. Um, Lauren may not have known, actually. I, I came know. in blind. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go to chapter one. Uh, the first first seven paragraphs. Firstly, the title of the of the chapter is my my parents and early life. Now, when you have a chapter or an autobiography, which is the first chapter, it usually is this um, you know similar words to this effect: my parents and early life, or school years, or you know things like that. And it's usually a pretty Uh, introductory pretty it's like one of those things autobiographers have to just put in there because like everyone needs to know like the first basic background of the um, the writer and usually it's pretty boring isn't it (laughs) it's like it's often when I read autobiographies um, I know people skip this chapter I'm I'm very uh, pedantic I like to read it even if it's going in one eye and out the other I tend to read it, but in, in this um, in this case of uh, Guruji, this is certainly not the case, <laughs> is it, Lauren? I also find it really interesting that he put my parents first and then his early life. Um, I think it says a lot about him that he realizes that without his parents, his early life would not have been in conception, perhaps. Um, But I feel like a lot of authors put their early life first and their parents second. Um, But yeah, just an interesting point to note. Very good point to note because he, as we know in the chapter, he explains a lot about the ideal parental um, setup for for a child and and the ideal parents um, amongst many, many other topics. Um, Yeah, Mike? For me, that 
uh, raises an interesting question, and that is, um, is it also the child's intention to start this life or is it just the parents? Because we always just think about it that you have two parents and they decide to have kids, right? But then what about the child itself? Maybe the child is in the astral plane trying to make this happen as well, especially if you are someone like Yogananda, definitely something like that happened. Um, certainly, um, we know that um, uh, if you're gonna have a realized master such as Guruji take birth in your family, then uh, you're no ordinary <laughs> uh, person. <laughs> Um, you're quite highly elevated spiritually too. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up, but now it's down. Yeah, yeah. Um, for for uh, for what it's worth, um, I, I've certainly read that um, uh, souls, more advanced souls, can choose the timing of of their incarnation to to a good degree, um, and it, it is uh, really to do with a lot of the karma of the parents as well. So uh, I suppose it's it's really a good uh, observation there to say that Guruji would have, um, you know, in that astral plane, certainly picked his parents uh, for for who they are, uh, and maybe have a soul contract with them uh, in the astral plane. So it is it, it is a really nice ob observation. Actually. I've also heard that um, masters such as Yogananda can pick not only their own birth and their parents and the womb that they uh, choose to inhabit. For those nine months but also the disciples and the devotees that he's going to uh, need or bring along in this particular incarnation and plant them where they need to be and that is certainly something we need to explore when we talk about some of Guruji's uh, disciples important disciples uh, but Lauren uh, uh, why don't you read out all the different topics that are covered in this chapter and it's quite phenomenal yeah, it's, it's quite a lot, which which is amazing, really. So we have the guru disciple relationship, Indian spiritual heritage and yogis, past lives, early memories, perfect parenting, celibacy and moderation, ancient Indian scriptures, work ethic and business attitudes, living modestly, mental equanimity with wealth, charity, miracles, divine healings, initiations, kriya, darshan, vision, visions, vibratory power of speech and thought. And it's all really been ensconced in the lightness and humour of Guruji, which makes for a very lovely read. And Chris? Unless I'm mistaken, I think there's maybe one to add at least, and the viewers can keep us honest on this. Uh, with the mention of the ancient civilizations, right? The, you know, with Egypt and uh, Babylonian uh, civilizations that didn't quite have the protection, let's say, yes. of, a, of a divine master. Good, so good spot. Uh, very good spot. Brian, how could you not mention very, the Yuga? Very, very what? good spot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me edit he did, it, he did it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> testing you. I was testing, testing you. Chris. This, this shows my, Chris does not favorite. need to do any homework. He can just come into the <laughs> episode. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Chris, were you, one of those, were you one of those kids at school that just like did no work and just walked into yeah. an exam and, ah, oh, Yes. <laughs> I, I, was, I was hated by many throughout my university degree. I was known for that, yeah. It's not, not a good thing to be known for, though, being lazy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I would, I'd love to have that uh, capability. I did literally the very inverse on that of that, as you can probably tell by my personality engineer <laughs> engineer uh, <laughs> let's so that's the chapter so let us now go to the first sentence <clears throat> the first sentence uh, mike do you want to read it out this one we have to read out unfortunately because uh, it is that important um, the characteristic features of Indian culture have long been a search for ultimate verities and the concomitant disciple guru relationship. Chris, as like read it out one that. more time because, as Mike says, there is big words in there. Go on, Chris. The, char the characteristic features of Indian culture have long 
been a search for ultimate verities and the concomitant disciple guru relationship. So in that, there is probably five or six <laughs> different sections that I'd like to cover. Um, firstly, um, the first words are like the Indian culture. So this this kind of the first sentence is uh, is in itself kind of a, like a summary of the book, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's the, the disciple guru relationship. But it's also the search that Guruji himself um, talked about, you know, in in beautiful detail <laughs> uh, and in, in inspirational detail. Um, but the the first words are Indian culture. Um, now I don't think uh, Lauren or Chris, you I don't think you've been to India, but Chris for Mike Yet. certainly, yeah, Mike certainly has. Yeah, Mike. I have been to India, but I don't want to say like I understand Indian culture any better than anyone else just because I've been there. But I do know that Guruji often stresses that Indian mentality um, has the there's a um, a way of analyzing and being skeptical at first about everything. That's I think Guruji also says that's a reason why Indians make really good scientists. Um, and I can see why this makes sense also to find ultimate verities. Is that why they also make good software programmers, Mike, as you've no doubt worked <laughs> with? Yes. I mean, I'm I I didn't draw that connection, but they definitely make good software programmers. I I do not. I was never a good software programmer, so I must be of the Western inclination. <laughs> Chris, spent too much time in England. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, yes, and as a as a recruiter, I've spoken to a fair share of Indian Indian developers, <laughs> IT developers. Um, it, it is curious to be actually looking at this, the Indian culture. Um, th there is a, a kind of open sense of devotion to to God and and in Hinduism. It's something I didn't grow up with, really. Uh, that wasn't really a, a common thing to see, that open devotion um, and this search for, you know, this, uh, for God through, through a guru. Um, it's, it's completely alien to me. You know, I'd grown up in Northern Ireland in this conflict between Protestants and Catholics. It was very much like nobody, it, nobody talks about religion. Nobody talks about God. You know, it really is... Uh, that much under the rug so it, it does strike me that uh, the difference in culture there it really is unabashful in its in its uh, seeking and it's a very beautiful it's a very beautiful thing I just wonder this is written 100 years ago what's it like today is it the same I think it is uh, by and large but I haven't been there as, as you said um, you know I wonder if it's changed at all this culture because the western influence uh, it it does maybe have some negative impact there as well as the positive impact as we're seeing in, in the West of the East. Um, if that makes sense. So it it's kind of that yin and the yang mixing a little bit. Mm. Um, it's an interesting one. Has it changed? Uh, obviously, I wasn't around 100 years ago, <laughs> but I can deduce um, various things. Or I'm have sorry. you? <laughs> or have you? <laughs> I'm I'm older than I look. You know, <laughs> the Kriya Yoga is working. <laughs> no it, it, i'm not that old um <laughs> but i can deduce as i was saying i can deduce um that it hasn't changed that much uh, certainly in rural india um and this is what i wanted to talk about really so indian culture in terms of spirituality if you go to any village in india and you have to go you have to go out you have to go out of the airport and you have to go you know travel for a, you know a good 50 miles into the wilderness and there'll be villages that uh, are very barely connected by roads and things like that um they every every village will have a saint that no one no one else in in the world would have heard about um every village will have like a form of mother goddess that is like it's a completely bespoke unique form <laughs> that's like being I don't know, created or developed over the years from the initial um, conception. Um, there'll be a temple or shrine in the smallest 
smallest little vistas, um, smallest like the edges of streets, corners. Um, and the, this is the difference between this and, for example, I've been to Greece and um, as you know, Mike Chris has been to, to Rome and various places in Italy. Um, there, there are lots of temples and churches in, in, in England as well, but they're not very um, well attended, shall we say. Um, but if you if you go to the India and you go to these places, these the smallest these, these smallest shrines, and people will literally be as they're passing, they they will stop their car, offer their prayers and their worship, um, and then and then go. Um, and certainly, if if you're from that village, you wouldn't um, before you go to work, you would offer offer your prayers before before going to work. So this this kind of like. Um, mentality or culture there's like you know timeless isn't it this would this is exactly what it would have been like a uh, hundred years ago and cities and towns are, are very different because um you know the, the way that the, the cities are built and the way the towns are managed things have certainly changed um yeah mike <clears throat> but also the towns in india are much more spiritual than in the west so i remember in delhi we went to a famous, I think it was a Sikh temple and they had um, a service really early in the morning at like six in the morning or 5.30 in the morning. And they would also give out free food. And we went there and it was packed. It was like everybody who's like working in all the shops and all the rickshaw drivers. And like, I mean, not all of them who were probably Sikh or had an, a connection to this temple. They came and this place was, but there were hundreds of people there all of a sudden. And then the service ended and everybody went their way again. Um, and that's just not how it is where I grew up in Europe or in America. <laughs> yeah, good, good point you made about that, that the towns and, and the rickshaw drivers, because even like the smallest like street street vendor or like a little cubby hole shop that you'd have like at the side of the road or in between shop in, in between big shops like that that sell like little biscuits and things like that they would in one small corner of their establishment they'll have like a, a little uh, ghee lamp and they'll have a little form of a, the, the image of god that's um, personal to them and so like i said the saint that might be from their village or the the matron the um the, the feminine divine that that they may be following in that in that particular village they'll have that image there and and they'll be offering their you know they'll be carrying out their business but under the under the prayerful hopeful mode that um that 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 method of devotion offers um lauren yeah i mean i haven't been so i i can't say for certain but i do feel like being in india would bring you closer to god and to the home within because living in this western side of the world it takes greater effort to remember god because you are not reminded outwardly sometimes of that but i feel like in india like you're saying when there's lots of different forms of of you know that that praise of god everywhere you go you're always reminded ah oh, yes so even if you've forgotten in a moment it's like ah oh, yes and, and you inwardly have that celebration of remembrance again. And obviously we don't need the outer to remind us of the inner, but I feel like it's very useful perhaps, especially in the beginning of, of your path um, to have that because yeah, we don't really have the same level in the West. As, as, Guru, as Guruji said that, you know, we're, we're uh, like, spiritual soldiers coming coming in to placed all over all over the world and maybe multiple worlds all over the universe mm -hmm. to try to you know bring some bring some light but I, I suppose maybe not not to dwell on this point too long but there's been severe prosecution of uh you know religious prosecution in Europe you know fundamentally that's uh that's a big big difference so the Indian culture uh I guess has been somewhat prosecution free uh compared to <laughs> compared to your compared to or no, compared <laughs> no to Europe, not even that. wow okay no. i'm missing i'm missing some i'm missing some um, education here we can we can talk about the yeah that but there's been a lot of invading uh forces particularly islamic uh, hardline islamic forces that have 
uh, tried to stamp out Hinduism and things like that. So they, they have and been, more, they have, yeah, go on, Mike. Yeah, and most recently the partition of India, right? Was a, along yeah. religious lines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, not yeah. a good, uh, okay. not a good part of history, but um... <laughs> diff, 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 different, different type of history. But yeah, it's it's still it's still quite good to see that it is very very open compared to Europe, a lot of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, we could debate that <laughs> until the cows come home, but uh, let's not. Um, but the ultimate event. So the, the culture sets the background for for Guruji's birth in in India, I suppose. Um, but he was. Um, we'll talk about his birth and where he was born, etc., in, in a later episode because this is this uh, chapter doesn't this section of the chapter doesn't cover it. Um, but the ultimate verities that he's talking about, the search, the search for the ultimate verities. Now he doesn't elaborate as to what he means by the ultimate verities, but one can imagine <laughs> from his teaching that he's talking of uh, you know pure loves, the unconditional, the selfless love for for, for God. And gurus and service to mankind and the brotherhood, brotherhood of, you know, and the sisterhood of, of to humanity. There's also things like um, ever new joy, infinite bliss, consciousness. You know, the satchitananda concept that uh, we're aspiring after, um, and also to be an example for humanity. Perhaps is that the verity that an avatar such as Guruji would would have, and something that we're aspiring to. Um, Lauren, what do you think? Hmm. I wonder if the reason he didn't elaborate on that is because truth is infinite in its nature, right? And I, I don't know where I remember reading this, but it said that, you know, once you've communed with God, then that is a truth which cannot be expressed in words, in, in the human tongue. So perhaps it's a little a little nod to to that it's and also it creates that sense of curiosity well well what it what are, are those ultimate verities what are those truths and and i want to find out and i think it speaks to those truth seekers who are reading the book to say ah oh yeah that's for me um perhaps mike mike is um mike is a verity a, a word that you use in your everyday language absolutely Yes, <laughs> I love, I love, I put all the, the fancy words in my speech that makes me sound more um, English. I do feel like when, when he, when he says that, I, that the picture that came to my mind was that first Gurji says um, that Divine Mother is playing such a trick on you by putting you in this world, right? And you, for you, it's all so real. And the ultimate verities is like somebody like, um, like the Saint Ramana Maharshi, right? Who just says, "Who am I? Who am I?" Right? That's the that's the truth seeker. And the opposite would be like what we see as modern prosperous countries, like in the West. What do they do instead? They just don't ask this question at all. They just go in this dream world and build themselves nice houses and everything, right? Google tells you opposite. who you are, right? <laughs> 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 who am i you are you this is your ip address this is your location <laughs> yes 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 let's look at my phone who am i <laughs> yeah so that's and and i i love that i that's that's a picture that came to me a, a, a yogi saint in a cave who asks who am i mm. Mm. uh we well, can also look at the selfie mode of a camera we can you know ramana didn't who am i yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ramana Maharishi yeah. didn't have the. Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> Ramana Maharishi didn't have the um, a selfie cam, um, but Lady Maharshi was unable to be cameraed, so he wouldn't have been able to answer that question by looking like that. <laughs> Left modern day devices. Um, right. So the next is um, actually you raised an English interesting point about verity and the language that we use in everyday. Um, everyday language because guruji's english is um phenomenal isn't it uh this the first sentence uh captures so much and this is why we're going to spend so long on this first sentence and part of that is the skill of the author uh the skill of this avatar we could call him a language avatar as well because his his skills of penmanship are probably unparalleled i don't think i've seen 
anyone write beautifully as he does. Um, and certainly my own English was vastly, vastly improved. I remember distinctly how how my writing and my creative English changed after the the probably the second reading of the autobiography, which is uh, which is quite significant because I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't very good at English if I'm honest. I got uh, yeah, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel like the the thing that first hit me when I came across the words in the book as I was reading was how perfectly they captured what exactly he was trying to say you know you find a lot of uh people in in the world they'll they'll use this wonderful language but it has little meaning but really these words are so intentionally placed and I I feel like that really Again, it sets the tone for the book. It sets the tone for him. We, we know that everything that's said here has a purpose, which I think is just wonderful. No. Mike? When I finished high school in Austria, I felt my English is on a pretty good level. I, I um, added English to my A-levels and I was very proud of my English that I could hold conversations with other people. And then the first time I tried to read the autobiography <laughs> of a yogi in English, it was a complete, a complete car crash. Like I, I couldn't <laughs> even get past page one. <laughs> I was so, such a, like, like, you know, you lose your motivation. Like there's one word you don't know, you just keep going. Second word, you keep going third. And then after a while it's, it kind of feels like okay i have no idea what i'm actually reading here <laughs> and then you, you have forget, to start looking you the words up. yeah then you have to start looking words up and it slows everything down mm. so much and like it actually made me uh, um that that's one of the reasons why it took me a while to read the book because and i i actually um reading it in german um was was the way to go for me in the beginning mm. Mm. It's, it's funny you say that. Yeah, go on, Chris. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. It's funny you say that, Mike, because uh, here's the autobiography of a yogi, um, Brazilian Portuguese version. And this is mm. the, the book that I'm holding here for, for the listeners that can't see. Uh, a book that I bought at my father in law. Um, and it's quite nice. I can see pages where he's he's um, kind of tagged the page and everything here. So mm. he's, he's read it through to the end. Um, and uh, my wife was saying, that, hey, like, you should read the book uh, to practice your Portuguese. <laughs> and my response was, are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> you know how long it would take me to, to, to read that? Um, just uh, on, on the basis of what Mike just said, uh, to, for me to read that in Portuguese. It's, it's a task that I think would be worthy of taking on, but it, it's not uh, for the light of heart, the paint of heart. So. Um, there would be many, many a word that I would uh, search in English, let alone Portuguese. Laura? Yeah, I always feel like I have to have my phone to hand with the dictionary present whenever I'm reading anything that he writes, because there's always something that, well, I don't know. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say is for anyone who's listening or reading, I feel like if you don't, if you're not even sure on a word, Google it. Because sometimes I feel like, oh yeah, I saw, I sort of know what that means. And then I'd Google it and be like, ah. And then I'd have a deeper understanding of what he was actually saying. So Google and the dictionary is your best friend, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, um, in, interesting, when, when, the, when, we read, when we're reading our lessons that are provided by Self-Realization Fellowship, they, they guide us, they tell us that you're not going to be able to get it the first time you read it <laughs> or you may not and if you don't then just re it's, it's better to read the whole lesson once through and then go mm -hmm. back and study what uh, what the words may mean etc um, because Guruji's words are it's like William Shakespeare but in modern day English that's in, you know that's understandable and we'll come back to William Shakespeare it's, uh, <laughs> it's an important point um Chris yeah, a, a couple of things here is one, um, Guruji did have the powers uh, to pray, well, pray intently and be given the ability to speak English whenever he did not have that ability before. So uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves to Google, uh, first and foremost. Um, uh, and secondly, you know, Guruji did teach us to try to build the power of intuition. 
to understand through through this intuitive sense. Um, and that's something that we shouldn't uh, underestimate as well. Uh, so maybe home this intuition and then maybe go back and Google and see mm -hmm. if you were right, of course. Um, but uh, Kurt, you did, did uh, try to teach. Uh, Interesting. Int intuitively understanding or understanding a word that you've never seen. Interesting. It would lead me astray all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, talking about Googling, uh, Lauren, um, mm. I'd, I'd highly recommend you get a dictionary app on your phone because apparently every Google costs like one kettle boiling or something of carbon. So I, I, t I like to use my uh, actual dictionary as opposed to searching on the internet uh -huh. all the time. Mike's uh, shaking his head. Yeah. And so, yeah, Googling, <laughs> Googling is not free on the environment. Um, uh -huh. But uh, interestingly, I'm That's... trying to find a really good uh, dictionary, a physical dictionary for my bookshelf. Yeah. And then I'm going to always use that because that's even better than using your phone of course because mm. using your phone uses energy and mike or shake his you head just again. use a, a book right and read it at candlelight at night <laughs> but the thing is the good thing about <laughs> online is <laughs> we do give you multiple definitions for the same which i'm not sure does physical dictionaries do that i don't know it's been a while since i've, I've, <laughs> I've not seen a physical dictionary in years, years. <laughs> 20 I years. Can physically <laughs> stick by what i said anyway chris <laughs> you you do have a solution to this actually to fingertips craig is uh, the website's called uh ecosia e-c-o-s-i-a mm. yeah plant trees, man. Org. yeah Plant go. some trees and search, search till your heart's content. <laughs> yeah. Dozier, yes, a have, sustainable I'm, I'm, search engine. I'm, I'm looking yeah. at it. I'm looking at it right now. That's my default. That's very good. Um, you, you have a, a nice garden, Brian. Plant yeah. some trees and then you can Google as much as you want. <laughs> Did I ask for this level of abuse? <laughs> All I said. You can, you was, can, you can sponsor, <laughs> sponsor more of my agroforest here in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. Or I could use my physical dictionary. I'm sure many listeners do the same thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> but let's go back to uh, this. So the ultimate variety we talked about. And then he mentions the concomitant guru. Sorry, no, I see I blundered the concomitant disciple guru relationship. Now, my blunder was guru disciple relationship because that is how it's usually um, expressed. Mm -hmm. um, but Guruji has very intently because everything he does is with a purpose, especially when he writes. He's very intently written disciple guru relationship. So in this rendition of this uh, immortal concept, the immortal relationship that is of the most importance in in every life that we uh, that we're we're born in, is that he's saying that the disciple is should be there first. Um, and this is not in my humble opinion to do with it being an egotistical thing this is to do with the disciple because the guru knows who he is the guru is guru means the dispeller of darkness um and the disciple has to become the guru as it were so this mm. this book is about uh, the disciple yogananda or mukundala gosh uh, becoming a guru yogananda or becoming enlightened and that is the truth for for us and our journey as well and that is the i think that is the in my opinion that's why the disciple is written there first um before we talk about what that would mean um there's there's a very good book called the guru disciple relationship by Lin Mata, which we'll talk about but yeah mike mm -hmm. i was also thinking i would always say guru disciple relationship because i've see myself as a disciple and as reference for the guru, reverence for the guru, I would always want to put the guru first. But here the roles are the other way around. Here it's like a guru preceptor writing it out and having a potential disciple reading it for the first time. And maybe that's why it's reversed. Mm -hmm. yeah. True, true. Um, so, what does the guru disciple relationship mean? Um, so there's Mrinili Dilmata has written a lovely book about it, and uh, I've covered a few topics in this um, in this uh, section that we'll read out that in that 
book, that little booklet is from the How to Live series. But um, for me, the the principal thing is um, loyalty. <laughs> the disciple has to be loyal to the guru. And brother, brother um, Anandamoy has has a lovely talk called uh, Loyalty, the Highest Spiritual Law, which is interesting. Why wouldn't uh, something else like truthfulness or like, you know, joy or all these other grand concepts, why wouldn't they be the highest spiritual law? He said loyalty is the highest spiritual law um, because, in, you know, he, he talks about why loyalty is is um, is in, in his talk and I'd highly, I'll put a link to it. It's a really, really good talk. But loyalty is not an easy, uh, easy, easy, easy thing, right? Um, for example, when you take when you take your lessons pledge, there's various things that you that you that you pledge that you'll do. When you take kriya, there's various uh, promises that you make to your guru, and they're not easy promises. And loyalty is one of the difficult concepts, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, as we'll see further along in the book. Even for Guruji, it's difficult when he goes to the Himalayas because there's this temptation there. So even the great masters, they they um, have to struggle to go through, right? So it's not just for someone who is a beginner because they're not spiritual enough, but it's it's a tendency and um, that you have to overcome. Yeah, Laura? Mm, I feel like loyalty tests our love. And perhaps that's why it's one of the most important, because yeah. there is love and loyalty. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly test your discipline, doesn't it, as well? Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris? Yeah, in, in marriage, um, it's the most important aspect of marriage. And you, you could argue that through thick and thin, you stick together. And... There's a very important lesson in that, in that you have the scope to fail. Like no matter what, you can fail and you can pick yourself back up and you can go again. And maybe it's a bit of a reverse meaning in that sense that yes, we're, you know, the, the expectation or demand or need is there for you to be loyal, but in return, I will be loyal to you forever. So in our disciple, you know, lesser disciple kind of level of consciousness. Maybe this, uh, the forms of guilt and, you know, uh, oh, you know, I didn't do my career today or I didn't do X, Y, Z today. I'm, you know, going backwards or, you know, you beat, people might be speed themselves up. But simply put that no matter how many setbacks you might have as a disciple, the guru is always going to be there for you no matter what, because the guru made that commitment to you. So it's, it, it's maybe this reverse meaning. I, it, it takes your full commitment and your full loyalty, but in return, you get that tenfold, you know, infinitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, mm. uh, aspect. Yeah. Guruji, Guruji writes that all true religions lead to God. And he says, seek until you find the spiritual teaching that draws and fully satisfies your own heart. And once having found it, let nothing touch your loyalty again. Give that path your full attention. Put your entire consciousness upon it and you will find the results you'll find the results you are seeking. Hmm. Um, interestingly, Brother Anandamoy uses this, this example in, in his talk. He talks about this, this disciple that, um, you know, he try, he's trying very, very hard to, um, you know, to, to attain, and he's very sincere, but he, he still, he couldn't break through. There's this barrier he couldn't break through. And, um, and Guruji, um, he went to Guruji pleading, pleading for his help. And Brother Anandamoy was like his secretary. So he was privileged to, to, to see, see these interactions. So this, this disciple was like, you know, pretty much in tears. And he was, he was, he had, he was on his knees kind of like pleading, praying or asking Guruji for, for his help. And, um, and uh, Guruji, like, he, Brother Anandamoy just heard the, him say, heard, heard Guruji say, loyalty is the highest spiritual law so he was talking about some some tests no doubt that that devotee had to go through some past life karma that he had to burn but 
he had to go through all that and he had to you know he had to come back to guruji and he had to to, to help him overcome that um, <laughs> that last hurdle as it were so it's it's not just that we have to um you know work work on our practices and uh, but also it's about um making sure that our connection to guruji is is there and we're loyal to that connection uh, because ultimately guruji will help us if we allow him to to cross that final hurdle um, and tuning into his will because uh, guruji says like when when this i shall die then will i know who am i <laughs> wonderful play of words uh, mike do you want to read out that next section i have in the card the guru helps the disciple in countless ways perhaps greatest of them all he inspires the chela through his exemplification of divine attributes he is the speaking voice of silent god and the incarnation of highest wisdom and purest love he embodies the soul qualities that reflect god he symbolizes the way and the goal christ jesus said i am the way the truth and the life from john 14:6 the guru is the way as the supreme example of the sadhana he gives to his disciple he demonstrates divine laws of truth and teaches how to apply them in order to realize god he gives the chela spiritual inspiration and vitality to follow the path that leads to eternal life in god hmm. we know That's this a lot of things yeah. yeah we know this divine ratio right that 25% of the spiritual path is your own personal effort um 25% of it is the blessings of the guru and he he takes on your karma even at certain points and 50% is by the grace of god yeah chris you mentioned a, a, a little booklet um the guru disciple relationship that's a really nice one to read but if anybody's doing the lessons at the same time um coincidentally or not uh, as yeah we talk about coincidences in this book uh, i uh, read the old lessons it was i think lesson 50 uh, very recently and that was about the guru to settle relationship very uh, beautiful um lesson in there that uh, guruji gives us um just on this topic that i literally read it a couple of days ago so if anybody, sorry, if anybody's on the new lessons, that's probably different. But the old lessons, it was, I think, lesson 50. So if you're following along and want to go to that. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Chris. I it. think I need to go back to that myself. But uh, yeah, this book, um, thank you for mentioning it. Um, she really talks about um, like how, you know, how each of us, we go through our lives from infancy, um, you know, to, to adulthood. And we search, we have this search for, truth in some way you know of, of some meaning or purpose for our lives when we're, in, when, we're, when we're adults um god brings us sometimes a teacher that inspires us sometimes books that inspire us and then we sometimes often we're still not satisfied and our striving becomes very strong and then that's when god sends a guru <laughs> um so this is this is uh, really important um, because uh, there's, there's a very important figure called um, Adi Shankara, Shankaracharya, which was a ninth century uh, Indian saint. And he, Chris, do you want to read out what he said about this subject? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No known comparison exists in the three worlds for a true guru. If the philosopher's stone be assumed as truly such, it can only turn iron into gold, not into another philosopher's stone. The venerated teacher, on the other hand, creates equality with himself in the disciple who takes refuge at his feet. The guru is therefore peerless, nay, transcendental. Very beautifully <laughs> articulated by Shankar. Shankara is like, uh, he basically reor reorganized the, the Hindu faith after centuries of um, turmoil, shall we say, lots of uh, mishandling. 
of various things. So he's a very important figure and very articulate, as you can see. Um, Mike, do you want to, mm -hmm. sorry, um, so Yogananda, so read what your Guruji's description of, of you know, the Guru is. Uh, Lauren, do you want to read that? Yeah. The Guru is the awakened God, awakening the sleeping God in the disciple. Through sympathy and deep vision, a true Guru sees the Lord suffering in the physically, mentally and spiritually poor. And that is why he feels it's, it is joyous duty to assist them. He tries to feed the hungry God in the destitute, to stir the sleeping God in the ignorant, to love the unconscious God in the enemy, and to waken the half asleep God in the yearning devotee. And by a gentle touch of love, he instantaneously arouses the almost fully awakened God in the advanced seeker. The guru is, among all men, the best of givers. Like the Lord himself, his generosity knows no boundaries. Very beautiful. And perhaps simply, he couldn't add all of that into the first paragraph because look how much depth there is in there. I suppose you have to, you have to read on, you know, read on because uh, putting everything here would very be very confusing for a, someone who hasn't heard the word guru before, perhaps, mm. <laughs> as many Westerners hadn't when they were first introduced to this book, and probably even now. Yeah. Although, although guru means something very differently in this day and age. <laughs> anything anything where you're an expert is a guru, which is, I hate that use of the word. And any devotees of Yogananda of this path, can I humbly request not to misuse the word guru <laughs> in this way? <laughs> Chris, sorry, Mike. Yeah, as a software engineer, I come across the word guru all the time because it's just software being used. Software engi engineer. This yes. Is so I, I, arch, I architect software with my brain, you know, no, but um, they, it is used so often. So if you are good at one programming language, you are called a C++ guru or something like that, right? So it's, the word is being thrown around a lot these days and for better or worse, but people know kind of word uh, significant or what the, what the meaning is kind of. Uh, maybe not in the truest sense, but at least the word has become much more popular than it used to be. Um, probably be interesting to to do an n-gram um, statistic from the 1800s till now. I'm guessing it would be like a <laughs> exponential like. curve. <laughs> yes, Chris. I think just to zoom out a little bit. Whenever this book was written and published. The world was very different to how it is today. And we, we talked about in a previous episode that Yogananda has been recognized as you know, the father of yoga in the West, the person who probably did the most to bring the word yoga into our vocabulary. Um, but even today, if you try to use the word guru, we're talking about it now that it's been maybe misused and, and, and abused to an extent. But my own personal experience is if I was to say my guru, I to somebody, maybe friends, family, or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, people, people in my network, they might tilt their heads slightly because they're, they kind of see it as a, a quite abstract thing, or maybe something that is more akin to simply people in India or something, even, even in this day. So th this information that we're getting, it's being downloaded into us by Yogananda, uh, would have been quite revolutionary for the time. Uh, because even today, it's it's hard to kind of break that ice that exists in, in the Western kind of mentality around this. Um, typically, I try to avoid the subject unless I'm really prompted into sharing the information mm -hmm. uh, because people people still don't quite understand it even today. Yes, and Guruji has done quite a good job in helping the reader to understand it in this first line and such a good job mm -hmm. that uh, such a deep job that we've had to spend 40 minutes and we've joyously spent 40 minutes <laughs> talking about the first sentence uh, and the natural order from inclination of the you know youthful energetic child to the goal which is the, the guru and that's everything in this lovely sentence and I think with that unless you have any more we can move on to line two <laughs> um, line two is is really about 
his own path. Um, and now he talks about his guru, his Christ-like sage, um, one that was chiseled for the ages. Um, and then he talks about like that being India's India's best, the best feature of India, really. Um, and and that they've these people, these greats have come in, you know, they've come to in every in every age and every generation. And that part of that culture that India has possessed um, of, a, of producing these super souls, as it were, um, has really stood the test of time. Um, and that culture is still there in India, as we talked about uh, just now um, at the start of this podcast. And, you know, if you think about the culture of and he mentions distinctly mentions Egypt here and Babylonia. We know, you know, archaeolog archaeologically, archaeologically uh, much about them. We don't know, we know how much of their culture has survived. I dare say, not much. But yeah, Mike. I was wondering why he mentions this here, and I can, I imagine that maybe with te our technological progress, we will probably learn more about ancient civilizations and this and the story between uh, between india egypt and babylonia we will probably learn more about it as um the time goes on and then we will probably look back at the sentence and see oh yeah guruji was right that's this is why india stood the test of time and those civilizations they don't exist anymore indeed Indeed, um, Chris reminds me of the story in the Bible of the uh, uh, is it Ab Abraham and so uh, Sodom, the city of Sodom, and God is uh, talking um, and saying that uh, if he if you find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, you would spare the whole place for their sake. And then it kind of went on and on. <laughs> you couldn't find the people. So it went down and down. You know, if I find 10 people, you know, I will destroy it. Like, come on. Um, and still they you know, maybe couldn't find it. And I guess there's that same meaning um, in, in this part of uh, the autobiography of Yogi that Yogananda is saying that India uh, is somewhat protected because there are many uh, seekers of God and there are many knowers of, of God there. And somehow that uh, simply spares uh, India from any kind of destruction that might come its way. Yeah, certainly knowers of God, because, um, you know, we talk about India's truest wealth. And, you know, in the previous chapter, we talked about King Ashoka, um, not chapter, the previous section, the, the, the bit on India. We talked about King Ashoka and his divine status. And, you know, we talked, um, if you go further back, then we have like Maharaj Parikshit, who was like, their descendants of, of the Pandavas in, in the Mahabharata and he was this enlightened guru who was uh, who enlightened master who was actually the king of the, of the land so you can imagine how an enlightened king would would rule his kingdom as and we know Ashoka was quite uh, spiritually elevated too and then before that we have Janaka who was at, around you know he was he was basically Ram's father-in-law so he was also a king and he um he was very, you know, very saintly and very realized. Um, and, you know, he's, there's, there's legends about his spiritual prowess. And so India's got this history of not just gurus, but actually like kings that uh, that were very spiritually elevated, which is quite a beautiful thing. Um, so that that is uh, quite unique, as it were, because in 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 Western history, for example, we <laughs> we just put a um, divine status on the monarch just by putting a halo around, painting a halo around the head. Oh, they're divine; they were God ordained. But what spirit, <laughs> what spiritual qualities uh, do they have? And Hen Henry VIII is a classical, classic case in point of <laughs> of this that I example I yeah giving Chris. <laughs> Yeah, th th this is kind of the history of the monarchy, isn't it? The, the tiara that, that's worn is, is a symbol for enlightenment, isn't it? So maybe once upon a time uh, when the world was in a darker place, there were those who were enlightened that maybe excelled. Uh, maybe once upon a time, I can't bring forward an example of this to my mind, but <laughs> please do uh, provide one to us listeners if you have one. But Maybe that was a necessary structure of time, but not so much um, 
uh, yeah, maybe maybe that was I should have died a death at some some time ago, uh, and it yeah <laughs> continues. But the Queen, to be fair to the Queen, did uh, a pretty pretty nice job to showcase the best of humanity in some way. Sad sad to see see her, see her go. Uh, some people would say, "Priyak." <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. But no uh, <laughs> but uh, interestingly, in Bab Bab I looked at some research uh, about Babylonia and the link with with India at the time because India was a very important uh, economy um, for for the world trade even back then. And in in uh, Bab Babylon, the city of Babylon, they they found um, they found teak wood from Malabar, which is in in it's a southern Indian state. So like like. For example, that, that teak wood is used in Rolls Royces right now, you know, in the dashboard. So like <laughs> from back then, that same commerce and that economy is is lasted, you know, 3,000 3, years, which is quite a, quite phenomenal. And historians point out that through that through Babylon, that India's metaphysics and metaphysics, mysticism influence Greek, Jewish and Gnostic philosophy. And, um, you know, we, we talk about India's influence uh, in terms of trade, but actually, um, you know, philosophically, there was some influence and Western scholars uh, may not wish to explore this. But if you look at, you know, ancient Greek philosophers and, and their thought, then, you know, it's, it's very Indian in its, um, in its makeup and its origin. Uh, and, it's, and it's like... Um, you know, concepts such as reincarnation and, and, and karma and things like that. Um, but interestingly, there's there's when when Shiva, you know, the, the god Shiva, when he had his first seven disciples, which were called Subdarishis, he sent each of them to the far corners of the world. Uh -huh. And so he sent one to like South India. He went sent one to the Americas and he sent one to Egypt and one to the Middle East. And wherever, wherever... You know, there is some root that you can see that in the Indian kind of root, but that's a subject for another another topic. But I think this is this is uh, what he, Guruji is referring to that when he says that um, you know India's the greatness of India has stood the test of time and it hasn't has sort of survived the fate of you know the the the, the poor fate of, of ancient Egypt and Babylonia. But uh, we yeah, Chris. Can I also just say a very practical thing here. The geography of India. It's very adapt to life. You have the heavy monsoon rains that brings the rains that gives us all the, the water, the essence of life, um, that gives us a mass variety of fruit, you know, that Yogananda would talk about. And Sri Yukteswar, Sri Yukteswar himself said that we are frugivores. So there's plentiful abundance of, of this life source that we need there. Um, and there's over a billion people there now, so um, it is a powerhouse in and of its kind of right for for a practical sense. So it is well situated to be uh, to, to be success successful in 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 that regard to sustain a civilization uh, as well. So I know that might be a bit mundane, but actually, <laughs> yeah, I do I do like the the, the beauty the beauty of it uh, as well. Yeah, I'm sure you'll like it when you one day visit Chris as well. <laughs> um, but let's talk about the, the start of this paragraph because he talks about a Christ-like sage. Now, this is the first of many usage of the word Christ-like in, in the book. And I dare say Guruji was probably the inventor of the word Christ-like, certainly in this context, um, certainly in the context of Indian sages. Um, but Christ-like, why would, why would he refer to He's obviously talking about Sri Yukteswar there, um, his own guru, and he said he was chiseled for the ages, and we'll talk about what that means. But firstly, why would Christ-like be used, um, Mike? So I think there's this big misunderstanding, even among Christians. I mean, depending on how much you are uh, actually, uh, uh, how, how well you know the teachings. But I remember when we, when I, I had like Catholic um, class, Catholic Christianity classes in school, and they kept telling us that Christ means the anointed one, right? And I never understood what that meant. And whenever anybody ever told me 
oh christ or something you know i know they meant that they were talking about jesus they were not talking about a state of consciousness and but guruji takes that um anointed one and actually says this is actually something that applied to jesus that jesus is his name christ is his state his spiritual state or he was probably even above that state and other people can also reach that same state and then when you say christ-like this is probably a very a scientific but also a way that people would understand way to tell people what he means somebody who is spiritually realist mm. it may it may put some people off because uh, referring anyone to christ <laughs> like they may may think oh it's, you know, that's for me how can how can anyone uh, think anyone else is equivalent to to christ um but uh, jesus as as mike said jesus the man became jesus the christ after his enlightenment and as guruji uh, elucidates later in the book through his journey to india <laughs> lauren yeah, it seems like in that <clears throat> sorry in that one word we understand the character of his guru um when you think of christ you think of all these qualities right and you think ah so uh, that's what Yukteswar had in him. But what I love is that it's Christ-like, not Christ in, in, one, in one word, because I feel like he had his own qualities that he brought mm -hmm. and that were really, really useful um, to many of his own disciples. So I think that, that word is such a great word because it, <laughs> it really does say what it needs to say. Very good point, because you could argue Jesus was preaching um, concepts that were beyond the scope of the ordinary man back mm. then. Um, uh, but Guru, uh, Sri Yukteswar was uh, speaking not only of words were, that were beyond his time, but actually words that are not just very relevant for today, but in today's language. So he talked yes. about yoga and philosophy in today's language. Um, so he talked, you know, we know about, we'll know later but on about uh, Sri Yukteswar's healing, you know, healing capabilities that were similar to Christ and resurrection capability that, that Christ manifested and, you know, taking the sins and karma of his disciples as, as Christ did. Uh, and, and that's even before the unconditional love. And But yeah, um, Mike, chiseled for the ages, I think this needs some looking at because why don't you read out something that Swami... Swami Satyananda wrote about Sri Yukteswar in his, in his biography of Sri Yukteswar. Look, there's no point in blindly believing that after I touch you, you will be saved or that a chariot from heaven will be waiting for you. Because of the Guru's attainment, the sanctifying touch becomes a helper in the blossoming of knowledge and in being respectful towards having acquired this blessing. You must yourself become a sage and proceed on the path to elevate your soul by applying the techniques of sadhana given by the guru. It is in the path of applying the techniques. Oh, sorry, rereading the same line again. Maybe it's a really important line. <laughs> it is in the path of meditation, truthfulness, and surrendering to God that the guru grace sadhaka becomes successful in gaining revelation and understanding of new methods of learning. It is with this perspective that Guru Maharaj used to say, real wisdom is one that beats the gurus, now that's a disciple. Mm -hmm. And Guru Maharaj would be Sri Yukteswar. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So it's a beautiful book, that uh, biography of Sri Yukteswar there. So that's, that was Sri Yukteswar describing really the spiritual path of a, of a disciple becoming the guru, as we talked about in the previous, the first line of this autobiography of the yogi. And the language that Sri Yukteswar used is just so uh, poignant, <laughs> even 70, you know, this is probably 100 years on since he spoke it. Um, but it's, it's very, very much chiseled for today, isn't it, <laughs> Mike? It's so such power in his words, and sometimes he he li he likes to ridicule our our thoughts, right? Like Sri Yukteswar, he's like, you have those expectations, and they're completely 
not um, not realistic. And uh, and I I really like Shiokesha has this way of of making a really really firm point, and afterwards no notes, right? So it's like yeah, um, definitely. Um, he like was in in one of the. And he's comical as well. He's quite funny. Like one of yeah. the analogies he uses, like he said, something, something, something is like a beautiful dead lady. How did you come up? We'll, we'll, cover, we'll, we'll cover that section. But it's, uh, it's yeah, language that, you know, youth of today would look and, oh, let me read this. It's crazy. And certainly, <laughs> certainly very um uh, you know profound as well because it was an important uh, message that he was conveying there but swami satyananda this is the second quote that we were given of his swami satyananda was uh, guru's guru's childhood friend uh, yogananda's childhood friend and he was also the principal of of uh, the ranchi school when when yogananda went to yogananda went to the west so uh, he's a very important figure in uh, in guruji's life um, and in in our lives, therefore. Uh, but yes, he's written four beautiful biographies, uh, and and uh, for Sri, uh, one of them is for Sri Yukteswar. Highly recommend you read. I'll put a link to those on in, in the description. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's, there's there's text and quote in there that uh, from his unique perspective, because his guru was Sri Yukteswar, and Yogananda was like a guru and a contemporary at the same time. So it's a very very unique uh, perspective that he gives. Let's uh, if. That's unless anything else got anyone's got anything else for that paragraph, we can move on to the Is any of you waiting for a chariot from heaven to descend. <laughs> yes, yes I, I'd love I, that. I wouldn't mind. Yeah. Would you would you jump off this life straight away without saying bye? Uh, um, yeah. No, I'll you can't. Bye. No, you can't. Say... You, are, it's, it's a, it's, you have to leave right now. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, I'll just say I'll see you guys later. <laughs> you, you, you might find that you're you're sent back. Uh, you huh? might not even have a choice. Yeah, that uh, would have been premature. Then yeah. I, I I write every one those really long goodbye letters, and then I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be you back. Have a, a, you, you have a Friends podcast to finish. Come for me. It's like <laughs> you, you have a podcast sadness. to finish. But yeah. surely, Mike, you should ask also where the golden chariot is taking you. <laughs> <laughs> Would I? I don't know. Be, be, you just go. You just go. You're every parent's worst nightmare. Mike. <laughs> Mike's just wandered off again. <laughs> they promised me candy. Oh, okay. <laughs> or um, or in uh, Austria, we like schnitzel or something, wouldn't it? Let's not go there. <laughs> what was that apple pie you made me have in in Vienna? Apple strudel. Strudel, yeah, that's it. it. I thought strudel. you wanted it to be vegan. Like, yeah, Brian, maybe I did. <laughs> Brian goes to Austria and, and goes, like, I love all the Austrian food, but I'm vegan, so I'll have none of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying to change try to change the world one small city at a time. I think we found a vegan a, a vegan pastry place somewhere, right? Yeah. Good, 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 we did. Good, I, good, yeah. Good, I could good never times. be vegan only because of honey. Honey is mm. just too sweet. Yeah. Yeah. But did you ever think of the yeah. bees? How hard they work? <laughs> now you can come and take it away. <laughs> Live in symbiosis. symbiosis huh? I, I, have, I found like a, a new favorite treat. It's like chocolate covered honeycombs. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so good. But I, I feel bad. I'm like eating a bee's house, like brick by brick, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We 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 actually do have um, rescued bees uh, here in, in Brazil uh, where I live, yeah. and we would okay. um, uh, through the deforestation that unfortunately happens. There's a volunteer that goes and rescues the bees, and we actually give them give them homes. So I don't eat their honey yet, but you know, never say never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they're if they're happy with it, you know. Yeah, I won't I'll comment on my feelings on this matter, but I'm sure you'll be able to guess. <laughs> <laughs> third, in the third paragraph let us move swiftly on yeah <laughs> anytime a politically sensitive thing comes let's just move to the next paragraph i think that's a good uh, <laughs> modus operandi <or> do you... <laughs> um 
paragraph three is um, really about his, apparently he had very early recollections of previous incarnations. Now, <laughs> if the reader wasn't um, <laughs> thrown into the deep end, he certainly <laughs> is now. <laughs> so we talked about Lauren mentioned all those lofty concepts, but now he's talking about not only <laughs> reincarnation, but actually remembering lives of a previous incarnation. Um, and not only that, he tells the reader that he was a yogi in the Himalayas, <laughs> which is quite profound. Um, and then he says that that vision is not just something that uh, is nice. You know, it was nice to have, but it actually showed me as a as a child what the trajectory of my life would entail um a glimpse of the future which is just absolutely mind-blowing isn't it mike it's mind-blowing that he remembers past lives and it's also mind-blowing that he remembers what he was thinking while he was in the womb so my question would be when i was in the womb did i still remember my past lives and forget them later on or did I was this memory already blocked because of because I reincarnated? Mm. It's, it's interesting. And then of course he saw himself as a yogi in the Himalayas, which is karma that he brings into this new life, right? And he he spends a lot of time trying to get back where he was in his past life and and finally abandoning that dream but it needs to be satisfied. So he puts a lot of effort in, right? We'll see this in this book. Yes, um, it is uh, in answering your question, I think somewhere somewhere in, in Yogananda's writing, um, he kind of says that in the end, you know, after all this dream, when your dream's dream is done, um, you will remember all your previous incarnations. So in, in some, you know, some, some part of your being everything is imprinted <laughs> you are just not uh, aware of mm. it but obviously Guruji is aware of it and that is what he's saying here and he's literally blowing the mind of a reader that's never heard of such such a concept in paragraph three um <laughs> this this is the kind of thing that um it was mind-blowing for me uh but I dread to think what it would have been like in 1930s and 1940s when, when Westerners read about mm. this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, these, these you're, you're, you're going to talk about his previous, previous uh, in, incarnations or birth, no, incarnations, let's call them incarnations. We have previous births and gurus have previous incarnations. Um, there's there's rumours as to what a guruji, um, what his previous incarnations were. And um, hopefully I'm not, uh, it's not a spoiler, but the rumors are that um, Krishna was Babaji. Babaji was Krishna um, and Babaji, Babaji lived, lived, lived on, uh, or Krishna lived on into this, to this present day by Babaji. And, um, and Arjuna was, um, Arjuna was Guruji. So in the great Mahabharata, in the Krishna Leela, um, Krishna, Arjuna was Krishna's cousin. Krishna was obviously the guru, and Arjuna was a disciple, and the Bhagavad Gita was spoken. And, uh, and therefore then, Babaji would then therefore be Yogananda's actual guru. And there's also rumors <laughs> that Sri Yukteswar is like a surrogate guru. And this is all obviously complete conjecture and rumor which doesn't have too much significance for our lives but it's fun to talk about mike those are such big big statements right <laughs> like if you are not hindu it might not mean much to you but saying that yogananda was arjuna is like saying yogananda was christ kind mm. of right or he was mohammed like mm. he was like really really big um the i also i heard all of those rumors that you just mentioned one thing in the autobiography, they say one of the names of Babaji was Shiva Baba, right? Yeah. Well, one of the um, names of Shiva, yeah. Ruth, yeah. One of the names of Babaji, right? And one of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, how does how does that go, go together? I never understood like the three um, 
uh, like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, are they actually avatars or are they something above that? Like it's it's really difficult to understand or or um, are, are they more like aspects rather than actual persons? Chris, please answer this question very directly. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you ready? Are you ready for it? Yes. <laughs> I, I actually think. I thought you were looking is, back. To, Babaji was like behind yeah, you or something. Chris just looked back. Yeah. I just, actually just, think Babaji. Yeah. Two seconds. Two seconds. I got, just... I got Babaji on the other line. <laughs> One second. Guys. Yeah, yeah. Let me answer <laughs> through his. Through, he'll answer through the. Could you, could we'll have him on the next. Yeah. We'll have him on on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only. There, Guruji there, says himself here these glimpses of the path. He doesn't say that he, you know. Sat, sat there and maybe delves into it in great detail. He, said, he says glimpses, he uses that word. So what are we to take from that? It, you know, does he have a glimpse and he can see everything in, in these lifetimes? Or is it just as he says, like what you might uh, confer, which is, it's a glimpse, you know, he sees, he sees images or, you know, um, he gets these inclinations of past lives. And so maybe we can say, okay, well, it was in this state of development that he was in. He was in the womb. Maybe mm. later on, he, he he knew to a much greater extent, and he, he was able to garner much more information. Uh, but, or maybe there, even as an avatar, there's going to be a limit to the necessity of knowing uh, mm. in certain stages of development. Mm. Um, uh, and with that comes the humility of <laughs> focus on the part of the garden that you can reach. That that famous famous saying. Um, so in essence, I have no idea, but it is fun <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> the omnipresent eye was not yet all seeing at that in those early, early phases. Perhaps <laughs> it was uh, it did not see as you as you it had a keyhole view as opposed to a panoramic vision. Possibly um, at that perhaps at that age before before Sri Yukteswar's uh, divine touch, I suppose, or maybe that's conjecture. Mm. That's I don't know. Um, but interesting, interesting, um, interestingly, yeah, we mentioned that um, uh, you know gurus can bring in devotees um, that uh, into this life. The the other rumor is that Raja C. Janakananda, who was our first president of SRF and a direct disciple, was Nakula. Nakula is one of the uh, twin, the twin brothers of uh, of of um, of Arjuna um and uh, one of the one of the five Pandava brothers so like and then there's there's, there's rumors that Dayamata and and some of the others and Mirnalini Mata was also was some important uh person from his previous previous life uh, I don't know actually but I don't know who it was about but yeah and um there's also uh rumors that he was William the Conqueror <laughs> I was with uh with some of the monks um <laughs> I was with some of the monks that came recently in, in last year and um we had to do a trip to um take they, they wanted to go to where hastings. Was it? hastings that's it yeah and the battle and battle um, Abbey. yes yeah. right yep and and yeah we had we had a beautiful meditation there so there must be it, they, those rumors go deep within srf they aren't just uh <laughs> amongst people such as us for you know uh doing podcasts <laughs> talking about fanciful things Chris talking about fanciful things yes um I think I think uh somewhere maybe Mike have heard you mention this that Guruji uh did say he was familiar with the knife and fork and eating eating with the knife and fork uh, as you would in in England or uh, versus in India where you would eat with your hands right is that somewhere to be found Mike yeah we'll we'll see that in a few paragraphs from here yeah it, it's right it's, okay i was going to say is it that close yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it is i'm not sure we i don't think we'll cover it in this episode but it is somewhere in the first chapter that's right okay i wasn't i wasn't uh imagining it in my, in my nice. mind and uh we talk about guru's english um and his english mm. is quite profound as we know and as was william shakespeare's and there's another rumor that guruji was william shakespeare mike so do you think this there's a theory now that Guruji got this English at like remember he was on that ship, he was gonna give that talk, but he felt like his English wasn't good enough, and suddenly perfect English came out. Do you think 
he, he made that karma to know perfect English in his previous incarnations when he was an English poet. So it came back to him now. <laughs> nice, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> um, Lauren, you you probably didn't know 90% of everything, that 90% of these rumors, uh, did you? No. What no. do you, being new to this path, what do you feel about those rumors? Do they, are they helpful anyway? Are they disruptive? Are they fanciful? Are they enjoyable? I think they're interesting. And I think they give us, for those who are curious about that kind of thing, it can ignite a feeling of wonderment and uh, curiosity, which might lead you deeper into your own realization. Um, but with all things, I feel like balance is key. And if you get too caught up in conjecture, then where's the room for truth? You know? So. Very, very well discernment. said. discernment. Very well said and too politically correct. We'll have less of that for future podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you knew this about me before you brought me on. <laughs> yeah, we needed some balance, uh, feminine balance as well as uh, political. Yes, indeed. <laughs> political correctness balance as well. Yeah, Mike? We mentioned that before, but the source, I'm not sure if it's the source, but uh, one, one of the sources for the rumors of Guruji being William the Conqueror is um, a nun, an SRF nun from the Nuremberg ashram in Germany, Sister Amrita. And she remembers past incarnations, spending her past incarnations with William the Conqueror being her guru and him being Guruji. And so she wrote um, books about it in German language and they were never translated, but they are very popular amongst the, the German devotees, and that was one way this rumor spread. Yes, and let's put a link to that, um, Mike. If you can mm. find the name of that book, we'll, we'll put a link to it because I was trying to find a translation, and yeah, none exist. I'll do it for you, Priya. <laughs> yeah. I'll, do it, I'll do it in my spare time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll translate. Thank you. Yeah. So All really, right. <laughs> GPT. Yeah. <laughs> So witnessing the past, present, and future it seems that he was doing in this um, in this paragraph as a mere babe, perhaps uh, in in the womb. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But the trans the transmigration of soul awareness from one life to the other is is a very deep concept, and this applies for us as well, actually, in our present day lives. Not 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 you know not utilizing uh, unknown spiritual powers from previous life, but actually in this life, how are you uh, changing as you as you put on all your different hats through your many decades of your uh, development? For example, when you create a habit now, um, are you could can you choose to create it for your future self comfort uh, and needs versus the present limited? person's needs mm. and desires so for us uh, this is a is a concept that we can use even in this life uh, to in, you know ingrain and develop good qualities and good habits that may be really uh, difficult like many of which are in terms of you know, things like diet and um, social interactions and all these things that uh, life pulls us in but you know, if you if you think about where you want to go and what you want to be and put that at the forefront, and then perhaps uh, it will help you <laughs> in, in encouragement and in motivation. So there's that uh, there's that element yeah. of it as well, I think, is uh, quite a nice uh, parallel for us um, because we change our we have many faces, don't we, in our lives as we develop yeah. and grow. Um, yeah. yeah before before we knew Guruji, after we knew Guruji, once we're established in the past, after we've been practicing the practicing the techniques, you know, for however many years or decades. And then hopefully at the end of that uh, beautiful day, that sunny day. Chris. Yeah, again, to look to the lessons, the old lessons, and yes, uh, for those who are um, paying attention now, I do not have the new lessons yet. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to buy them. Uh, but the old lessons, I think there's word on this in lesson 47, similar, similar sort of um, uh, space to the, the, the previous lessons I mentioned on uh, the guru uh, disciple relationship. Um, 
the old lessons around lesson 46, 47, I think it is. Um, uh, Guruji talks about this, about the power of habit and, and you carry the habits over from past lives. So if anybody wants to delve back into that subject, that's uh, a, a nice um, lesson for you to, to go back to, to read. Yes. Unless anyone's got any more for this paragraph, let us move on to the fourth paragraph. Um, so this one is about how he remembers remembers very much his infant years and his helplessness, as it were. Um, and he remembers being unable to do things that he wanted to do, which is quite profound. Um, and then he also remembers that he had a very like prayerful nature which um which he wanted to which he wanted to express but but couldn't um, because of his you know youth his young body perhaps young mind um chris before we go on to the next line what do you have a... what, what what i thought of when i read this was well what language was he praying in mm -hmm. and Ooh. you know if he was getting getting used to the bengali uh language then he clearly you know, didn't have the grasp of, of, of the language because he was he was becoming accustomed to it, as he said uh, here in in the sense. Uh, so maybe that is to say that to pray you don't need a language, possibly. Um, it, it did strike me as curious. True, true. Uh, when you have a when you have a moment of nice feeling of devotion or joy. It doesn't express itself as a language, does it? <laughs> Just a lovely feeling, doesn't it? Um, yeah, Mike. I suspect that our consciousness, while we are in the womb and while we are very young, is limited. Um, and I think the reason for that is that what Guruji describes here, this powerlessness that that we have, that we would go insane otherwise, maybe. And he, as an avatar, doesn't have any of those limitations and can describe it in, in great detail. I guess if you were born as an infant, you probably don't even know all the things you could be doing, right? So you don't think about them as much, but he, he has recollections of past lives and everything, right? For him, it's, it's different. And that's why he was probably like, come on, can this be over already? Can I, can I grow up? <laughs> mm. um, and even before that, he, he like in in the first line in the wake film he says i was conscious in my mother's womb feeling her movements mm. feeling her movements in in my body um so these feelings would have perhaps even been before his birth as well <laughs> which is quite <laughs> profound isn't it um and he said he says in in the next line um his emotional life uh, was expressed in in many languages so not just one language which is interesting so he's bi or tri or quadlingual <laughs> even before he was he was born um so perhaps he's talking about his thought there and he said in all those confusions um he got accustomed to the bengali language um what a scope of an infant's mind he's saying but usually limited to toys and toes <laughs> like... so what do you guys think? What language do people speak in the astral plane? Mm -hmm. I'll just leave that question. But but I I wonder he comes, he's he's thinking in he's already incarnate, he's already in in the in the body, in uh, even though he's still a fetus probably, but he's already thinking in languages. I wonder if he's things in languages that he would think in in the astral plane or if they have languages at all or if he just remembers languages from previous incarnations yeah um yeah we we'll, hopefully one day we will know <laughs> um maybe we do know we're just not aware yet yeah. um the, the one thing i found yeah chris i was just going to hark back to my favorite subject of the yugas um of uh, telepathy being uh, an element of the higher yuga the the idea is this universal tongue must must exist in some way um for peoples of different places to understand each other and and then when you descend into the lower yugas that ability to understand comprehend what's going on and the breakup of all these tongues causes conflation and, and, and you know 
confliction between peoples. Um, so yeah, may maybe it is that simple um, knowing, sense of knowing, of conveying information um, beyond the, the use of, of language or words. It's fanciful to my mind. <laughs> I wish I wish, wish I could comprehend the golden age uh, <laughs> in this in this uh, to a part of the era. But yeah, fascinating subject. It is. It is. Um, the the next the last line, i.e., the beguiling scope of an infant's mind, which is adultly considered to be limited to toys and toes, is um is a very interesting one because he's there. There he's he's obviously. In, in the previous lines, he's telling us that he was not limited to such things. But here it's saying that all children aren't limited to such things, which would then imply that the psyche, the psyche of a child, you know, in those early years is quite, um, is not as simple as we would like, you know. So things like what are we exposing our children to? Are they don't understand they, that that is not. That is not the case at any point in in the in the early adolescence or you know the childhood phase of of of, a, of of your child. So that would then imply that you need to we need to really be very careful with how we parent, <laughs> um, not just uh -huh. uh, not just um, not just in like what we're teaching them or we're exposing them to, but actually our own our own state of consciousness, our own energies. Um, you know, my there was like my wife and I were when we were considering having children, we're not we're not we're not gonna have children now. Um, but when we were considering having children, we always thought um we always thought about are we like are we ready yet to like be really good positive examples to to, to bring a bring a new life. And we 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 really we're really that was really challenging for us because we didn't feel we were we didn't think we were anywhere near ready for that, that such a big responsibility and that wasn't the that wasn't in the end that wasn't the reason why we didn't have children but um i remember that philosophical conundrum mm -hmm. um of, of not feeling that uh, we would be good enough to to for for, for concepts such as this because you know you want to you want to do your best right <laughs> mm -hmm. um Chris? I know this is a podcast on Yogananda, um, but since I, I don't think there's a lot of material out, out there from Yogananda on this subject, um, I can reference another living guru in, in Sadhguru that does have some material on this that I think is quite quite interesting that he says not to, or to simply um, be very positive, caring and loving, you know, around children, especially under the age of four. Um, because uh, there's some develop developmental stage there that the soul is essentially deciding whether or not it wants to remain in in the in that body in that being. Um, so you want to make it as uh, at home as far as possible. There's something something to that effect, which uh, you know I I find curious um, to to no end. Um, but uh, yeah, ev evidently it's it's going to be more important uh, at those years of development than what we know of. Mm -hmm. certainly so let's move on to the next paragraph which talks about the you know Yogananda basically is suffering in his in his childhood through crying and um psychological um psychological problems basically um in terms of dealing with dealing with life <laughs> um and his family were confused at his distress that that must mean that he was very emotionally he felt or to, to the others he felt he was very emotionally all over the place compared to the other other of the ch children <laughs> two children that were before him yeah chris i did wonder when i read this is this like a sign of high, highly enlightened beings or something <laughs> coming into the world that's you know kick and scream like oh i experienced this you know unbounded consciousness and i'm limited, limited to the the pudgy body of a, of a baby. Um, uh, you, you, would, you would look out for all the babies that are crying um, uh, in distress because it might be a sign, but that's just fanciful uh, wanderings of my, he my says, mind. He says psychological ferment and unresponsive body, which were the cause of that. So basically he wanted to uh, express himself 
more, but he body wasn't yet ready, <laughs> ready, which is the cause of his crying. And they say like um, a, a baby's like energy is like quite powerful because like the amount of energy it takes to cry <laughs> is quite a lot, isn't it? And they could how long they can like exhale that cry for however long. If we try to do it now, we'd probably get tired within the first couple of minutes and collapse but babies can Dusty. do it for, <laughs> yeah babies can do it without seeming uh limited in their ability to carry on <laughs> so yeah. in some ways they've got this they, they've got access to this pool of um energy uh and perhaps this is and this is a yogananda right so he's got this infinite pool of energy so perhaps his cries were infinitely <laughs> louder and infinitely longer than you and i and mike I think was it Babaji who talked about Lahiri Mahashaya's cup of life energy being almost mm -hmm. finished, right? And I think you, if you imagine it like that, you are born with a full cup and you can just live, you have all this energy to spare and waste. And then um, as you get older, this be becomes less and less, and you have to be more and more thinking about what do you spend your energy on. So when I when I look at children, I feel like they are just they're just bundles of energy. And I mean that's how people call them often, right? And also their immune system is is very strong, like whatever colds they get. Like if you had that as an adult, you would probably die. But as a kid, you can just you can just fight it off. <laughs> yeah. Um, is Mike? Because it was your cup there that you're talking about. Was it half full or half empty? Um. So it was full to the brim, Priyank. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. If it's half full or half empty right now, that depends on the day. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, and his family, he says, were very distressed, very bewildered, sorry, by, by this distress, which is understandable. If it was really that bad, <laughs> it sounds like it was. Um, <laughs> but he says that they were happier times as well. And then he specifically mentions his mother. And sure. this is, this is a, I think, a quite a beautiful thing, um, because he's got a fantastic uh, adoration and love for not just his birth mother, but the divine mother. Um, so, Mike, do you want to read out his um, what Swami Swami Satyananda says about Guruji's um, relationship, as it were, to the divine mother, and how he could, how Swami Satyananda would, you know, re use that potentially to 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 speak to to or to convince Guruji of certain things. So, read this out, Mike. If for some reason there was some harshness in the mind, the word ma seemed to completely soften Yogananda's heart. Once I was in Calcutta, um, engaged in following some regulations and duties set by Yoganandaji. When I was brought up the subject of going to East Bengal, he refused to let me go and told me to comply with the rules and stay in Calcutta. The discussion progressed. And when I said, my mother is there, I'm going to go and see her, his heart softened at once, and he let me go with no hesitation. We have seen that if there was reverence for any woman, the essence of the Divine Mother would immediately awaken in his heart. Oh, that's very sweet. Very sweet. So I think this might be a lesson for us. If we want something from Guruji, we just refer to... <laughs> <laughs> divine mother. my mother is there yeah <laughs> refer to divine mother guruji please let divine mother help me do this <laughs> let the divine mother help me she would have want she would have wanted she would that. Want yeah <laughs> she would want that for me <laughs> um yeah the, the, the morality of this but it probably works seeing as swami satyananda used it <laughs> used it to his, to his benefit um yeah so it's quite uh his guruji's love for not only his actual physical birth mother but divine mother is is really beautifully expressed as we go in through this chapter mike so this is a question that's more politically so you might just 
ignore it and move on. But I, I just, when he says East Bengal, does that mean that India at this point was split into different states and it was difficult to travel between them at this time? Do you know anything about that? Uh, so he wrote this in, um, no, he wrote this before partition. Yeah. So yeah. then there wouldn't have been any difficulty at the time. So no. he's just okay. referring to an eastern part of Bengal as opposed okay. to East Bengal that was Pakistan right. uh, at one yeah. stage. Or Bangladesh yeah. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Bangladesh now. Yeah. Um, happier memories, apparently also so he talked about his mum's caresses but he also talks about being able to that that moment where he's actually able to speak um and take take a step uh so he's quite joyful um i don't know what your earliest memories are but i remember specifically actually being able to um because i had quite when i was five we moved from india to england and i had to i didn't know any english and when i learned english I, I, no i remember like being completely baffled by everyone <laughs> and i couldn't i remember i like i, I couldn't understand why i couldn't understand what people because i didn't mm. understand this whole concept of different languages so i distinctly remember my bewilderment at my own bewilderment at this confusion of tongues as guruji <laughs> guruji puts it so and and, and then that also enable me to really enjoy then being able to learn English and to communicate in English. I remember my like my uncle or someone in India told me like if you don't understand anyone, uh, so if you don't understand, the first thing you need to tell people in English is I do not speak English. That is the first thing. So I remember I used to use that as like a brandishing card everywhere, even if no one asked me anything. I just walk over to someone and say <laughs> say this silly line, <laughs> say this silly line. But yeah. yeah. Um yeah. I, I, I use that for in Portuguese today. So <laughs> not follow Portuguese. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Um so he talks about these early triumphs, um, but apparently they're quickly forgotten for the average Joe such as us. Um uh, but for mm -hmm. but they're also a basis for self-confidence, which is an interesting child psychology concept, self-confidence. <laughs> It, it is interesting that he says that here because if you think of Guruji, confidence would come to mind, you know, eventually down, down that line. He's, he's just brimming with confidence and he gets that from his inner inner knowledge of, of, of God or as he says it here himself that these early triumphs that he had uh, are, are, are a natural basis for self-confidence. So it's a very human um uh thing that we can all relate to uh which is just another uh another aspect of what guruji is, is is done throughout the book which is make himself very relatable and uh, making god realization very relatable um but uh, for me one of what are my earlier memories i've got some when i was like two or three but there was one i think when i was four or five or something um and i had a nanny and she was trying to dress me and i refused to let her dress me and she got really mad um, and she actually slapped me. She slapped me uh, on the hand and I told my mom uh, what, what this was and she, she fired this lady. But uh, <laughs> I, just, I just remember this episode as I can actually remember where I was in my, in my room, uh, sitting on the edge of the bed and she was trying to force this jumper over my head. And I was wrestling with her because what Yogananda teaches us, uh, which I remember this when I read this lesson early on is the evolution of the will of willpower you know as you're a baby and as you're growing up as a toddler and as a child you don't really have your own will so to speak you, you go by the will of your your parents if you're lucky to, to have them uh, and you, you kind of go by the instruction then as you grow older you know this will you have to express your willpower and often this would cause friction between you and your loved ones because the child wants to feed themselves they want to do things themselves so, so that was one of my earlier memories, which was this expression of will. It was really strong. <laughs> it got me in trouble with my care at the time. Laura? Um, yeah, I think my earliest memory was when I was about two. It was quite early on. And I remember I was in my cot. And what I can remember is the room and sort of what it looked like and just looking out from my eyes. But I had this toy. And my mother came in 
and I was dropping this toy from the cot so she would pick it up and I just remember feeling really amused the fact that I could you know keep doing this and she would keep picking it up and it was just like this little like inner laughter where it was just so funny um but yeah I, I do find it strange at what point we start forming memories because that that is probably the earliest one but I wouldn't say that I've remembered lots from the age of two but that one always stuck with me that just like but that summed me up as a child just very mm. cheeky <laughs> <laughs> nice Lauren sorry Mike I feel like my when I think back of my early memories it's it's either moments that I where I was at great awe or moments that were of great maybe excitement or sometimes commotion or something that those stick usually so I grew up in a, in a suburban house in Germany and life was so peaceful there and like one thing that I um, remember is that I used to love eating um, uh, raspberries and blackberries and then one day my mom told me you know they grow behind the house. You just need to go there and pluck them and put them in the basket. Why don't you go and do that? And then I went there and I saw there was this plant and there were all those blackberries. And I was like, oh my God, this is so great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this is for some reason um, a, a memory that I, that, I, that I always, like I don't have many because I, I moved into a bigger city in, in Vienna when I was like, six or seven and 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 there most of my memories are after that point and the memories before that point are so magical because I feel like growing up in a suburban environment is so much more serene and peaceful and you make mostly good experiences whereas when you're in the big town there's like all those people and everything and life becomes a lot less controllable. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but interesting that you, that story you mentioned, it's certainly about self-confidence building. Yeah. Um, and good, the fact that Guruji has put it on here uh, and made it like a dedicated a line the fifth, in the fifth paragraph means that it must be important for children to develop at the earliest possible age, um, which is uh, interesting in terms of raising children um, and being a good... Good, good, uh, good role model to children as well. As well, so that's quite cool. Um, sixth paragraph. So he says that being able to remember is not, uh, you know, is not unique for him. He says like lots of yogis have retained, completely retained their consciousness without any, um, without any interruption from one life to the other which is uh, again this is another one of those bombs that he puts out there <laughs> so it's not just him this is a common thing for for a yogi uh, yogi is one you know yogi means union yoga means union so one who practices that or is able to practice that is a yogi um so that's quite uh, profound and the the life death and rebirth of avatars this is really quite profound stuff that he's talking about in just the sixth <laughs> sixth paragraph because if you can if you've got that level of awareness that you're not just a realized master you're basically an uh, incarnation of divinity aren't you um mike yeah, we talked about uh, the key verities earlier right and one of them is definitely the reincarnation of souls um that this is not our first life or i could say it's not our first rodeo we have been have done this many times right and of course he makes sense that he uses the occasion of his own birth to explain reincarnation and the whole process and it's so interesting it is so different than any anyone else they would just say I was born this day and not mention much else because but he starts out explaining about his birth even before he was born and then he even while he's in he talks about his feelings while he was in the womb while he was an infant child 
So it's a completely different way of explaining what birth actually is. And I think the reader needs to understand this further along in the book as well. So that's why he gets this out of the way here. Mm. Chris? My dad shared something with me recently. Uh, the listeners can check it out. It's quite interesting. Um, a guy called James Houston, which coincidentally is the name mm. of my, my dad. Um, uh, he lived, um, lives, uh, I think he's alive, uh, currently in the United States. And he, this young, young chap, I think he's maybe seven or eight years old or nine, maybe not, um, had talked about a past life uh, in, in such detail that they were able to prove uh, that there was a, certainly a person that existed that this boy claimed to be in a, in a previous life to, you know, this, this huge detail. And the, the boy isn't a yogi, and, and certainly in his past life, he didn't seem to be a yogi. yogi. He was fighting in, in one of the world wars. Um, and it, it's curious to me that maybe certainly this isn't um, unique to people who are yogis, but actually it's this phenomenon of life in, in and of itself. And sometimes, you know, quite seemingly ordinary people might get glimpses um, into this that maybe... Um, uh, guided by the hand of God to try to awaken many uh, others who, who might not be on this path of yoga, but maybe opening their consciousness up slightly bit by bit, uh, because there are many stories that exist throughout the world of um, past incarnations, people being able to recollect them. Yeah, um, yes, definitely. But and this, the putting, putting it in so early, all this heavy philosophy and concept, if you if you're not willing to accept any of this or even just to be a bit intrigued and to read on at this point then you should drop the book <laughs> and this, this is probably why you should that's probably why he's put this here because if you're if you're gonna question start doubting everything at this point and we're ready to give up then he's like every paragraph he's adding a bit more and a bit more and then if you if you get past this like cliff edge, then it's the pasture that you can really you know really enjoy. Um, but if 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 you can't get to this peak at this point, then you should give up because you're not ready for this book or this book isn't for you, and therefore this path probably isn't for you because you can't you can't grasp not just grasp you can't you're not open enough to be able to dig 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 at this point, uh, which is I think. Uh, an important uh, probably an important point for the average reader one who hasn't heard about or you know maybe you've heard about it Lauren you you would have heard about all these you know things such as life you know past life and regression mm. regression and analysis and you know people things that people do or psychics can claim to do but you probably wouldn't have heard read it in such a succinct and uh, well well scientifically explained way such as this yes so i don't know what your experience was when you read such this this heavy stuff it, well i was going to say to me it didn't feel heavy yeah, okay. for me it felt so light even though i felt the depth of it for me it was like well that just makes sense you know and it, it was like that finally there is something here that obviously i can't relate to it because i don't remember necessarily these things but it's Oh, what? I thought you did. That's why we invited oh, you. Oh, just so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so modest, Lauren. I know. Well, they do say modesty is one of the many qualities we should be cultivating, right? Um, but yeah, it just ignited again that, that sense of wonder and that sense of homecoming where it's like, yeah, okay. And, it, you know, this is just the start. And it was just exciting to me to finally be able to read something that I'd been wondering about and I felt some you know inclinations towards so yeah but I guess everyone's different aren't they it depends where you are in your own life it will depend how you relate to the to the words yeah so when ascending this peak you were an experienced mountaineer with uh, <laughs> fitness fitness to match the desire and will <laughs> Mike I think also the, the consciousness of people have changed has changed a lot right like even in my lifetime, when I was uh, younger, and maybe it's also because I lived in Europe and not in California, but when I brought up something like reincarnation, people would always, some people would say, what is that? Or people would like, 
immediately there would be an immediate turnoff. And now everyone seems to know exactly what this is. And the question is only to what degree they feel this is actually happening and how much they actually think about questions like that. So I feel like people have come a long way already. Certainly. I wonder how far they were along their journey when Jürgen and the first published. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> um, Chris? What's the story about Yogananda in a, I think, a carriage traveling across India, maybe, and he's sitting sitting across the way from an actor, and the, he essentially says to the actor, um, trade your my madness for your madness, because it's all madness, essentially, and he convinced this actor to, you know, follow on the path of Kriya Yoga and, and so on. Um, but it was quite a sweet, you know, humble kind of way that he put it. Uh, and this, to some degree, you know, to some people, they would think it's mad, it's madness. It's so absurdly abstract to their mind, they can't comprehend any of it. Um, but uh, the, the comprehension of the uh, of uh, of the nature of reality is is maybe beyond the 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 ability of of the mind in a logical or rational sense. So, like like you said, Frank, you know, if you if you're not on board at this point, if you're not willing to go along you know, for the journey, uh, yeah, that many people probably probably uh, would simply put the book down. I haven't heard many instances of that, though. I haven't heard anybody saying, yeah, you know, I tried it. It wasn't, wasn't really for me. It's such fun. No, you haven't given certainly... it a shot of people then, Mike, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I have heard this. Ten more. I have heard this a lot of times. Me too. Yeah. Have you? Really? Chris, oh, yeah. oh, Chris oh, yeah. only giving the book to like yogis, going to the Himalayas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say my hit Fair. rate is probably less than 1%. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm coming from you're, a strong bias perspective then. For too me, like Lauren said. You're, you're too inspiring as a human. Your, your, your yeah, sheer yeah. charisma must bring you, bring the reader half yeah, the way. Yeah, 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 or yeah. I think, I maybe think you you're, right the first time. you're very in tune, Chris, mm. and you know intuitively who to give the book to. Mm. True, true, true. You know? I've got to put that positive spin more, on there. More, <laughs> nice. more, books, more books out, more books, yeah. I think, is probably the, the more accurate, <laughs> more accurate take. Um, um, so yeah, he ends this, Guruji ends with this paragraph of saying, essentially, uh, if if man is not the if you know if if you didn't have a soul then that would be the end you know this this body would be that would be the end of your life and your existence there'd be nothing further um, and then he refers to prophets that spoke the truth about essentially this reincarnation truth and what your purpose is and um, and then he says that man is essentially soul incorporeal and omnipresent <laughs> kind of he kind of uh, kind of takes the reader down down this journey isn't it with this paragraph like um because like as i said it's really heavy so the reader may doubt and then guruji answers that doubting so he says if man is just a body then this is where it would end so then you're doubting people like yeah that's true as so your peak doubt is coming and then it's been answered and then he beautifully ends with uh, the prophets that have spoken this truth and that a man is just a soul it's not the body um i think it's really 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 nice with the bit of mid word alliteration there with incorporeal and omnipresent um that's really poetic i think that line and we can uh, meditate on that certainly so the seventh paragraph and the last paragraph you'll be pleased to know as we reach two hours <laughs> in this podcast i think this is the record guys Congratulations. <laughs> this is going to be to the um, Mass Vidal episode, which we had for two hours. But uh, I think this is a worthy, worthy <laughs> podcast Absolutely. for it to yeah. exceed the two hours. We're very sorry, listeners. And thank you for, if you're still with us, thank you for staying with us. <laughs> Seventh paragraph and the last paragraph. Um, he simply says that, um, you know, although it's odd that I can remember these things, it's not, um, it's not rare people can um and he's said that he's tr he's met and heard about lots of people that have had had this experience um and i wondered who he was talking about there um because he doesn't uh, doesn't elaborate there 
but uh, perhaps you know Theresa Neumann, um, the great stigmatist uh, to which he dedicated a chapter to, perhaps St. Francis of Assisi, which I know he has a very strong admiration and devotion for. Uh, Mike? I think also just regular people, because I think also these days we are more advanced in psychology and people talk more about childhood traumas or experiences and things. But I feel like back in the day, your whole, you, you, everybody put their whole personality behind a facade or under a rug, right? And you would never ever go in there and, and look at any, any of your past experiences. And he was maybe like an early psychologist, right? Who went to people and asked them about, tell me what is your earliest memory? That is a question that you get asked more often today than I imagine in his days. Yeah, Chris? Mm. Jesus maybe was another one that he's referring to. Jesus uh, and um, John the Baptist or Elijah and who? I forget. Sorry. Elias? <laughs> El 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 Elias, thank you. Eli Elijah and Elias. Um, so maybe maybe a reference uh, to the yeah, SRF guru, uh, Jesus himself. Very true, very true. Um, that is that paragraph. Um, so very, very action-packed. <laughs> first seven paragraphs and first page of the book um and you know in this in this just first podcast we've covered in some pretty deep subjects we've covered the disciple guru relationship talk about spiritual heritage the indian spiritual heritage and ancient civilizations and perhaps the indian influence on such civilizations we've talked about memories and reincarnation and the parenting the perfect parenting and the influence on early childhood and our being able to remember everything that we experience in our childhood so it's uh, quite a <laughs> quite a heavy first page and uh, perhaps that is why it took us two hours to to go through it but i i should hope that the rest of the <laughs> paragraphs won't be as intense as this i know some will be but um hopefully it gets a little bit easier and a lot a uh, little bit more storytelling type vibe um so lauren if you want to open the last page um, unless anyone has got um uh the last action packed first paragraph page unless anyone else has got anything else to add don't think shakes of the head uh, you don't want to, Chris, you don't want to go for the third hour. I'm up for it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Chris, Chris is Chris is a big fan of long, long format podcasts, aren't you? Mm. He doesn't want to put a time limit. He wants to break Zoom. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's uh, it's going that way, this long format conversational <laughs> style. If, if people have time of the day to tune in, that's uh, that's fantastic. But no, was, no, it's it's uh, more about the content, isn't it? <laughs> I, was, I was reading podcast theory, and twenty minutes is how long oh, podcast should be, and we have thrown that way out the window, <laughs> especially with this podcast. Completely disagree. Yeah. <laughs> we, have to, we have to create our own podcast theory. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're we're not uh, we're not posted into the TikTok, thankfully. So be the mm. change, be the change you wish to see in society. Lauren, mm. podcasting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing uh, yes please read the whole thing and we'll end it there thank okay. you everyone Jay Guru when I am gone Paramahansa Ji said the teachings will be the guru those who loyally follow this path of self-realization and practice these teachings will find attunement with me and with God and the Param Gurus who sent this work through the teachings of self-realization fellowship one finds all the guidance and inspiration he needs to follow confidently the path to God. Every self-realization list should strive unceasingly to live by Guru Deva's counsel. His teachings are applicable to every aspect of our lives. They must not be for us a philosophy only, but a way of life. Those who live by Paramahansaji's teachings unqualifiedly know this truth. Between disciple and guru, 
no separation exists. Whether the guru is in physical form or has left this earth to dwell in an astral or casual realm or in the spirit beyond, he is ever near the disciple who is in tune. This attunement leads to salvation. In his oneness with God, a true guru is omnipotent. He can reach down from heaven to help the disciple to realize God. This spiritual succor is the divine and eternal promise of the guru. Great is the fortune of the disciple who is led to a true guru. Even greater his fortune if he strives earnestly for, for perfection by obedience and true dedication to the guru's teachings.